The Great Pyramid at Giza has remained a complete mystery in modern times. When was it built? Who built it? Above all else, what is it? Conventional Egyptology declares that all pyramids were tombs for the pharaohs. The sophistication required technology and cost of the Great Pyramid conflict with the thought that it is simply a tomb. This level of effort for a burial place stretches common sense to the breaking point. To quote Alan Alford, it is so crazy to suggest that the unique design of the Great Pyramid was a legacy from an earlier, more advanced culture. In my view, it is certainly much less crazy than continuing to believe that the pyramid was constructed as a tomb for a dead king and that he built this totally over-engineered and revolutionary wonder of the world with absolute perfection at the first attempt. It is proposed that the Great Pyramid was a nuclear fission production mill and it was a technical and financial success. It did not create energy, but packaged energy within artificially created isotopes of plutonium. This hypothesis is not fantastic in the sense that it would be a physical impossibility, but is fantastic only in the fact that it upsets the conventional history of man. The approach is to drop preconceptions about religion and culture and look upon the Great Pyramid as a business investment. Wait till you hear this. The history of the ancient Egyptian civilization was recorded in hieroglyphs cut into stone. Even when paint was used on the stone, the symbolization was first cut into the stone. None of these stone records attribute the Great Pyramid to a pharaoh or anyone else. There is no record of when it was built, why was it built, or what its purpose was. There are no symbols cut into the stone of the Great Pyramid. The accuracy and the precision of the Great Pyramid, both at the level of individual blocks and as a whole, are without precedent. Modern day engineers are at a loss as to how it was done. The tools described as necessary for the cutting of stone and the positioning of stone have never been found, nor are they referred to in ancient records. The precise cutting of granite, including precise interior surfaces, requires complex powered machinery with industrial diamond bits. The raising and exact positioning of granite blocks as heavy as 80 tons to heights as much as 300 feet above grade would require huge powerful cranes according to current industrial practice. It is simply beyond the capacity of wooden structures and human laborers. The entire positioning of the whole structure is so accurate that modern surveying optical equipment would seem to be an absolute necessity. The interior fit of stones in the King's Chamber and Great Gallery appears to be almost watertight. A mortar was used which had a higher hardness than the stone it was used on. The mortar was analyzed for elemental content, but it has not been duplicated. The construction has a hard industrial signature rather than an artistic one. The Great Pyramid was built to last as a process plant for a very long time. The heart of the pyramid is the king's chamber and the heart of that is the sarcophagus. This was also the heart of the process. The uranium oxide would have been fitted into the sarcophagus. It may have been put in as bricks or pellets or even in granular form, depending on the oxide used. The sarcophagus was fabricated from a very hard granite, even harder and denser than the rest of the granite used to build the king's chamber. This fact is a very significant signature of its function. The interior dimensions of the sarcophagus are very precise. This is consistent with maintaining a very exact amount of geometry of the uranium oxide. The outside of the sarcophagus was rough cut. This reflects the fact that the outside surface of the granite is quite unimportant to the fissioning process. The granite must be able to withstand the high temperatures and radiation emitted by the fissioning uranium oxide. It has to survive the damage from radiation for a long time. 
it must allow passage of most of the neutrons, which it does. Photographs show that this granite sarcophagus has undergone radiation and heat damage in a very gradual manner over a very long time. Its appearance is very reminiscent of metals and minerals, which experience long-term radiation in the canyons of the plutonium mills at Hanford. The damage or wear indicates an operating time of many years. The King's Chamber is made of very large blocks of granite. The inner surface of the granite bears a striking resemblance to interior walls of a plutonium mill. Once again, there is the appearance of long-term exposure to radiation and heat. The floor and walls of the chamber appear to be very well sealed. This is consistent with the King's Chamber being flooded with water. The water in the chamber has multiple roles. It is the medium which slows down neutrons and reflects them back into the uranium oxide pile. It is also the mechanism for removing heat from the chamber. The south air shaft from the outside to the chamber would have been a pipe for continuously adding water to the system. After a short horizontal run from the king's chamber, it rises at a 45 degree angle to the outside of the pyramid. Hydraulic calculations for water indicate that the flow would vary from 5,900 to 8,400 gallons per minute depending on the back pressure of the water and steam in the king's chamber. The water would have flowed out through the entrance to the king's chamber down into the great gallery. The exiting water would have carried away radioactive soluble isotopes. A second air shaft connecting the chamber and great gallery to the outside would have been a vent, which released steam and non-condensable gases. The final roll of water is very interesting and quite ingenious. The reflection of neutrons by the water back into the uranium pile must have a careful, narrow control to it. The mean free path of a neutron in water is about one foot. A neutron must undergo about six to seven collisions in the water to finally reach the appropriate speed and be reflected back towards the nuclear bed. If not enough neutrons are reflected, the fission reaction will die down. If too many neutrons are reflected back, the reaction will begin to grow rapidly, producing too much energy. However, when the energy production goes up, the water heats up and begins to form steam and the steam occupies about a thousand times as much volume as water and it would progressively occupy more of the volume of the king's chamber as more energy was released. The design is a passive and very stable system for controlling the rate of fissioning in the sarcophagus. When operating, the king's chamber would have always had some volume of steam in the upper portion. This volume would have grown and shrunk in response to the fissioning rate, keeping it in control. The complex structure above the Keem's chamber is a sort of shock absorber. The monstrous blocks of granite with air pockets between them absorb most of the effect of the explosive steam at the end of a batch run of uranium oxide. In fact, the granite beams could crack all the way through and still remain in place. The much smaller and much weaker blocks of limestone could not be used for the ceiling of the king's chamber. The queen's chamber is probably the laboratory, which chemically extracts and purifies the various plutonium oxides from all other waste. It is noteworthy that this chamber is placed quite a distance from the lower end of the great gallery. This distance would give added protection to workers in the chamber. The two shafts which leave the queen's chamber are of unknown purpose, but they were definitely pipes which conveyed material. Waste separated from plutonium would have been walked back to the well shaft and dumped down it. The wearing of gold face masks, etc., would have been excellent protection from the radiation in the Queen's Chamber. The production of fission such as cesium-137 and strontium-90 are quite soluble whereas uranium and plutonium oxides are extremely insoluble. 
A constant pass-through of water in the king's chamber would have flushed these short-lived radioactive isotopes all the way to the underground chamber via the great gallery trench and the service corridor. The service corridor is small and winding and mostly vertical. Human travel through it would be very difficult and pointless since the ascending and descending corridors are available. It shows extreme erosion. Why would a pharaoh's tomb pyramid have extreme erosion in a shaft isolated from the outside world? Even floods would not have reached this corridor. The obvious answer is water erosion over a very long time. Partway down this shaft is the grotto. The position just barely below the surface of the prepared bedrock base for the pyramid. The underground chamber has an interesting geometry. The eastern half is about six feet below the termination of the descending corridor. In the center of the eastern basin is the bottomless pit, so called because the earlier discoverers could not find a bottom. The western area is about eight feet higher and it has five bench-like protrusions and two depressions. A walkway is cut from the eastern basin up into the western chamber, halfway between the two large benches. To the south is a horizontal chamber that is 30 inches wide by 30 inches tall by 53 feet long. This last excavation could not have been dug with hand tools. The material is bedrock and there is not enough room to swing a tool such as a pick, especially with the worker lying on his stomach or his back. Powered machinery seems to be the only reasonable answer. The purpose of the underground chamber was twofold. The first purpose was to drill a hole down through the bedrock to a sand layer below. The depth might have been 100 to several hundred feet. The radioactive water coming from the king's chamber would finally go down the hole and disperse into the sand layer. This is a routine methodology in secondary recovery oil fields where they inject hot water or steam or gas into a sand layer. The sand layer would have accepted and retarded the migration of radioactive isotopes long enough for them to decay to trace levels. The second purpose was hydraulic power. The entire floor of the underground chamber bears an amazing resemblance to the support structure for a water-driven turbine electric generator. The water wheel would have extended out from the western chamber into the eastern chamber. The water coming down the descending corridor would have shot across the water wheel. The benches on the western chamber floor would have supported the rest of the machinery, including the generator. There is even a support and depression for an oil cooling system. The stairway cut into the western floor gave access under and behind the water wheel to where the shaft and couplings would reside. Based on the projected water flow from the king's chamber, the dynamic head of the water dropping almost 300 feet and a turbine efficiency of 78%, the produced electrical power would have been from about 29 kilowatts to 41 kilowatts. This is an adequate amount of power to provide lighting within the pyramid and to run modest electrical machinery in the queen's chamber. The chemical separation of plutonium from uranium involves the use of electrical power, just as it was done at Hanford, Washington. This generation and use of electricity would have been entirely within the Great Pyramid, hidden from outsiders. The floors and well hole are strongly eroded. The obvious eroding agent is water, and the entrance to the descending corridor is well above the landscape, so natural flooding could not be the cause. The grotto, which is just off the surface corridor, would have been a logical position for an electrical distribution point and for changes in voltage. So if this is the case, what were they generating all this power for? It is entirely obvious that this pyramid is of an unknown age, but it is certainly older than at least 10,000 years. Wouldn't you guys agree? Comments below. Thanks for watching. So the article is, is, is based on flawed logic. Now, it almost looks like the blade had a curvature to it. So, there's one way to find out if it was a curvature, and that is to put a straight edge on it. 
<laughs> uh, I do even big blade to do that. That's probably what that hole is over there where the blade was in. Yeah. So this is Chris testing for flatness of a possible ancient cut surface. But it's actually uh, quite flat. Well, no, it's got a bit of a... The surface comes out here and then it kicks in. You've got two right cuts, in there. two different cuts there. Yeah, you've got two different cuts, yeah. It comes down to here. Actually, there's three. It ends there, right. then it steps out. There's one there, one there, and then it slips out. It appears that when they were actually placing these these basalt blocks into the table, they were they were just kind of slicing off uh, just to make them fit, just to you know have the top surfaces come together uh, and, and just knocking off little pieces here and there. That's an ancient saw cut, you can tell. It was here. You look at that, you can see how the surface could have been pounded by stone to get the, the surface. But here, that's clearly evidence of some kind of tool like a saw cutting through the material for the top half. This is at the Great Pyramid. And similar to Peru, what we see is different materials, uh, different forms of workmanship from crude to incredibly refined. Here again, we're going to look at another saw cut example. But this is, uh, I'm just blown away. This is the Great Pyramid of Giza. Giza. But here, have a look at this. This is an obvious saw cut. See, this is the this is the rough layer, and then this is not only flat-ish, but the, you can see where the cutter, like the saw or whatever, stopped because here is where it's broken away, and on this side too. But what blows me away is the, just the number, the amount of evidence here is nuts. Oh, I know. So this is the Great Pyramid at Giza. And there, the original, what's left of the original casing stone, you can see right there. And this is just our first half an hour here at this blows me, it completely blows me away because we've seen obvious evidence of machine cutting technology uh, in basalt which would require, as far as I'm concerned, tungsten carbide or diamond tools. Uh, and that's obviously why we're, we're here with Christopher Dunn and Stephen Mailer because this is the expert on technology. He works in a very modern um, establishment and has done for 50 years in terms of working with the most modern high-tech equipment for cutting materials and shaping materials. And with Stephen Mailer, we have the oral tradition based on the work of Abdel Hakim Awiyan. So with the two of them, we have a full the ability to look at the left brain and the right brain approach. Amazing stuff. I, I had no idea it would be this incredible.